A couple of months ago, I made a video on my high performance linear actuators and I received a ton of feedback on how I could make them better. After looking through that feedback and having a careful think about what I want these actuators to do, I realized that a redesign was absolutely necessary. So in this video, I want to cover the design, the performance and the assembly of my new, even more high performing linear actuators. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, as with any design, it's absolutely critical to clearly establish your design requirements before you get into any of the fine details. For my design, because I want to use this for Jugglebot, I need my actuators to be fast so the Jugglebot will be able to move around quickly and catch and throw balls as it needs to. I need these actuators to be stiff so that there's as little slop as possible in the system. I need them to be self-contained or modular so that when I put six of these together into a Stuart platform, I can very easily chop and change them if one of them breaks. This is going to be really important if I want to ever do any performances or anything with Jugglebot. I need to be able to just quickly change out parts if anything fails. I also need these actuators to be as precise as possible so that when the platform is moving around, I can be confident that it is where it should be. Finally, I need these designs to have a high endurance so that I don't need to be continuously replacing parts and fixing them. Now, before we get into any of the nitty gritty of this specific design, I think it's a good idea to have a look at how the old design worked and how well it performed. As a quick overview of the design, there was a carbon fiber frame that provided structural stability, as well as two strings that when pulled would move the linear actuator. One of these strings was to extend the actuator and the other string was to compress it. There were also six bearings in this upper bearing block that constrained the central carbon fiber tube and only allowed it to move straight in and out. If you want to see how the last design worked in any more detail, I suggest checking out my last video on the topic. Now let's have a look at what this design did well. There were a couple things, namely that it was very fast and it was very stiff. These were my two most important design requirements for the last design, and I would say that it did them quite well, but unfortunately this design was not all sunshine and dandelions. There were some problems with it. In no particular order, the bearings contacting the central carbon fiber tube led to quite a lot of wear on the bearings, and I don't think these bearings would have been too happy going through tens of thousands of cycles. There was also a string that was being clamped between the central tube and one of the bearings, which the string, again, was not too happy about. There were some issues with the assembly of this design, involving me needing to hammer the parts together, and this led to quite a few of these parts cracking while I was putting them together. This design was also not modular. To see what I mean by this, we can look at the entirety of Jugglebot as it was put together with all six of these actuators. If we just look at a single one of these actuators, we can see that the motor for the actuator is in the bottom of Jugglebot, in the base here. This seems fine at first glance, but when you think about it, if there's any problems with any of these actuators and I need to restring them or replace any of the parts, the whole of Jugglebot is going to be not functioning until I fix that. I really don't want to have to deal with issues like this, so I'd really prefer if the design was fully modular and able to just swap the parts out. And finally, the problem that garnered the most amount of feedback from everyone on YouTube was the Bowden tubes for this design. These tubes had a lot of problems with them, namely that they kinked and buckled and had quite a bit of slop in them, not to mention the wear and tear that would inevitably accrue over tens of thousands of cycles. These were problematic. So, how is the new design any better than that? Well, to start off with, there are no more Bowden tubes. This design is a lot more sleek than the previous one because the strings are being internally routed through the carbon fiber tubes wherever they can be, making the design a lot more elegant as well as modular. By having the motor contained within the actuator itself, if any of these parts break, I can very quickly take out that actuator and replace it with a fully functioning one, meaning that Jugglebot will have as little downtime as possible. Additionally, I no longer need to hammer anything when putting these actuators together. Using these clamping mechanisms that only require a single M3 bolt, I'm able to very quickly and easily add or remove these structural carbon fiber tubes, making it a whole lot easier to put the actuator together. I've also changed the way that the bearings contact the central carbon fiber tube by adding these TPU sleeves to the bearings, minimizing the amount of wear and tear that should happen there. Now you might be wondering, how are these strings routed? How does this even work? Well, to answer that, there is a central spool that attaches directly to the output shaft of the motor, and around that spool are wound two strings. One string is for the extension of the actuator, and that's shown here in blue, and the other string is for the compression of the actuator, and that's shown in green. Each string needs three pulleys to route it around to be in the correct place. This is actually a very interesting geometry problem, and I'm not sure that it's even possible to do this with fewer than three pulleys per string. If you've got any thoughts on that, I would love to know. Now you might be wondering, where is the third pulley for the blue string? Well, that's all the way at the top of the actuator, up here. That pulley needs to be at the very top of the actuator so that when the string is pulled, it will pull the central carbon fiber tube out 
extending the actuator. Now this is all well and good in theory, but how good is this actuator in reality? Well, to measure this, I tested a couple things, namely endurance, speed, precision, as well as strength. Now strength doesn't really matter too much for my application, but a lot of you were curious about how strong the previous actuators were, so I figured I would say to your curiosity and measure the strength of these ones. The first of these metrics is the endurance of the actuators. The first prototype that I made managed to get to 39,000 cycles before it failed. And to see why it failed, all we need to do is see how it looked at the beginning of its run versus at the end of its run. And you can see pretty clearly here that something is causing the central carbon fiber tube to twist so that the string is getting caught underneath this bearing here. And that is exactly where it failed when the string broke. I'm still not exactly sure what's actually causing this problem to happen, but thankfully it was a pretty easy fix because all I had to do was change the part of the end of that central tube and have it so that it rolls against these structural tubes instead of just sitting freely in the middle of them. After I made that change and put the final version together, it easily passed 50,000 cycles with very, very little sign of wear. I'm fairly confident that it would have gone for a lot longer than this without any problems. If you're curious, the speeds that I used it during this test are shown here, and this was equivalent to more than five hours of continuous runtime for a total distance traveled of 15 and a half kilometers. Needless to say, I'm super happy with that result. Let's move on to the speed testing. The maximum speed that I was able to get out of these actuators was 50 revolutions per second, which equated to 3.4 meters per second, which is extremely fast. I'm very, very happy with these. Now you might be wondering what breaks first? Like what's stopping these from going even faster again? And the answer to that is that I actually can't slow down the actuators fast enough. I can speed them up just fine, but I'm having a really hard time with slowing them down and dissipating that power. If anyone watching is familiar with setting up brake resistors or using regenerative braking with batteries, I would really appreciate if you can give me a hand. I have come to learn that I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to this sort of stuff. Either way, I am super, super happy with 3.4 meters per second, and I think that's definitely fast enough for now. The next test along is precision testing. Before I did any testing of these actuators, I wanted to get an idea of what the theoretical limit of these actuators were. And after doing some calculation, I realized that the limit is 8.4 micrometers. This is absolutely nuts in my mind, and I really wanted to figure out a way that I could actually measure these on such a fine level. The only problem is that the most precise tool that I own is my digital calipers that have an accuracy of 0.02 millimeters. And unfortunately, 0.02 millimeters is a lot more than 8.4 micrometers. So what I did is I made a 10 to one pulley mechanism so that I could amplify the motion of the actuator and measure that amplified motion with my digital calipers. If you're curious about how the string is routed here, it's shown here on the right. Now, the way that I ran this experiment is that I would move the actuator to a position. It would hold that position for about 10 seconds and I would record what the calipers displayed once they had settled down. And then the actuator would move again and I would record the value. And I did this again and again and again. And you can see the results of this experiment here. I was able to get four good runs with this setup before the string in the actuator broke. And that gave me a total of 65 data points. Once I ran the numbers, I ended up with a standard deviation of 0.057 millimeters, which as you'll note, is a lot more than 0.02 millimeters. So I could have just put the calipers straight on the actuator itself. And because I wasn't super happy with this data, it was quite messy and there was a lot of problems with this pulley mechanism, I did just that. And I found after taking a total of 100 readings, pretty much exactly the same standard deviation as before. Meaning that I could have saved myself a whole lot of time if I had just done this in the first place. The next test along is strength. Again, I wanted to get a rough idea of what to expect here before I ran any tests. And so I wanted to test how strong the string itself is. It has a quoted minimum braking strength of almost 32 kilos and a working load limit of just over six kilos, but I was a little bit skeptical of these values. So I wanted to do some testing myself. Needless to say, I am very skeptical of the quoted minimum braking strength of this string. It's definitely not 32 kilos. So, I gathered a bunch of stuff that I had lying around, clipped it all together, and attached it to the end of the actuator. And to my surprise, it was fairly comfortably able to lift this almost seven kilo mass. But when I tried it with the bag from before, it wasn't so successful. So how good are these actuators in reality? Well, they have an endurance of over five hours continuous runtime, a maximum speed of three and a half meters per second, a precision of less than 0.06 millimeters, and a lifting force of almost seven kilos. So I'm pretty happy with that. That said, there are some places where some possible improvements could be made. The first of which is to use the body of the motor as the spool for the string. This would dramatically simplify the routing of the string 
potentially increasing the strength of it, but absolutely increasing the manufacturability of these actuators. The only problem is that that would require a full redesign of the actuators. This was actually something that was suggested in a comment to the previous video, but unfortunately I didn't see that comment until I was putting together this video, and I really wish that I had seen it because that would have saved me a whole lot of time in designing these actuators. I will definitely be keeping this idea in mind if I ever redesign these again. Another idea that was suggested in my previous video is to use synchro mesh cable. This cable is super strong, very stiff, and I'm really surprised by how easily it routes around pulleys. I would have thought that due to its really weird shape, it would have had a hard time getting routed around, but it's absolutely fine. The only problem with this cable is that I can't figure out how to terminate it. If you've been following this project for very long, you may know that I've been terminating the current strings by wrapping the string around a bolt a couple times and then tightening that bolt up to clamp the string. The synchro mesh cable is not flexible enough to be able to do that, and I can't think of any other way to terminate it that allows me to quickly and easily change the tension in the line. If you've got any ideas here, I would love to know. Another change that I will probably make in the nearish future is to the bearing block of the actuator, which is the top part where the six bearings sit. I mentioned before that I'm currently using these TPU sleeves around the bearings, and I'm not super satisfied with them. They slip off the bearings fairly easily if they get bumped, even though I've super glued them on, and because of the imperfections in their printing, they're not perfectly smooth and their profile is not perfectly symmetric the way that it should be. So I'm thinking I might change these sleeves from TPU to heat shrink, similar to the ones that I showed before. Another problem with this design is that when the actuator is fully compressed, there's very little resistance against torsion of that central carbon fiber tube, allowing for this wobble here. I don't think that this will cause any issues for what I'm doing, but I don't really like that it can move this way, and so I'm thinking I might modify this bottom cap so that it engages with all three of the structural tubes rather than just one of them, and that should hold it a lot more firmly in place. Overall, I am super happy with how these actuators have turned out. They're really compact, extremely modular, really powerful, they've got great endurance, they're just, they're really, really great. I'm very happy with them. And of course, because I'm putting these into a Stuart platform, I've built five more of them and have put them all together to make the current version of Jogglebot. Unfortunately, controlling all six of them is a whole different matter. If you're interested in making one of these actuators yourself, you can find all of the information you need in the description to this video, and at the very end of this video, I'll be putting assembly instructions for how you can put it all together. Before that though, I just want to mention one sort of housekeeping thing about this project. Up until this point, we've only been able to communicate through the comments of these videos, and that's a little bit clunky and not really prone to having in-depth detailed conversations. So what I've done, per the recommendation of one of my patrons on Patreon, is to set up a Zulip site. Now, if you haven't heard of it before, Zulip is quite similar to Discord, except that it allows you to set up the site so that it can be read by anyone online. This means that if you're curious about any part of this project, you can head to the site and have a look through what I've posted there without needing to make an account at all. You can just click on the link and just straight in. If you want to post to the site, you will need to make an account, but that's fairly easy to do, and I hope that it's worth it. I'm really keen to be able to communicate with you all a lot more closely. As always, I hope you found this interesting, and until the next one, have a good one. Before actually building the actuators, I found it really helpful to get everything just out on the table so that I had it all in one place and ready to go. To see what's needed here, check out the link in the description where you'll find a bill of materials and all the other information you need. I start off building these actuators by putting all of the small pulleys in place. Some of this can be a little bit tedious, but with a little bit of finagling you can get it to work pretty well. Just know with these as well that three of these pulleys use 14mm bolts and one of them uses an 18mm bolt. The one that needs an 18mm bolt is the one that comes in from the bottom side of the 3D printed part. There is also one that needs a 40mm bolt, but that's at the very top and that's pretty easy to see. The next thing I did was to super glue all of the TPU sleeves onto the M8 bearings. I did this now just so they had plenty of time to dry until I needed them later on. Next up, I added all of the threaded inserts into the parts. There's one M5 insert that goes into the very bottom of the actuator, and there's five M3 inserts that go into different places. The motor mount plate has four of these inserts, and the fifth insert goes in the cap of the central carbon fiber tube. I actually forgot to put this one in at this stage, so I had to do it a little bit later on. Because of the geometry of the motor mount plate, inserting these inserts can make a bit of scragginess, and it's a good idea to shave this off so that, that way that plate slides nicely into its mating part. Now the next thing I did was to insert the encoder. I suggest using 6mm M3 bolts, and that way you can insert them into the encoder before you slide the encoder into the plastic part. This makes it a lot easier to get those bolts in the correct place when you're bolting them in. 
Next up, I attach the motor mount plate onto the motor using four M4 by 10 bolts. When you're doing this, make sure that the motor mount plate is in the same direction as I have it here with respect to the cables for the motor, because otherwise those cables will be in a really janky spot in the actuator. The next thing I did was to add the six bearings into the bearing block. This is fairly straightforward and very similar to what I did with the last actuator. All you need to do is put the inserts into the bearings and slide them into their slots on the bearing block. These are all bolted in using M3 by 20 bolts. Because of the way that these parts printed, I actually had to hammer these carbon fiber tubes into the bearing block. And so I did this now before I put in the other three bearings and that way I didn't have to hammer onto the bearings themselves. Ideally, this wouldn't be the case and you should just be able to insert the carbon fiber tubes straight into the bearing block. But I didn't realize until I'd already printed all of these bearing blocks that my printer was having a little bit of an elephant's foot and I had to hammer them in a little bit. Again, it's a good idea to check that the carbon fiber tube is sliding nicely through this bearing block. The next thing I did here was to put the heat shrink onto the M6 bearings. There's a very fine line here between having too much heat shrink and too little. If you have too much, then it tends to kind of shroud around the entire bearing and you can't fit any washers or anything in between, otherwise they rub. And if you have too little, then it just comes off really easily. I found that a seven millimeter length of heat shrink worked perfectly for these bearings, which are four millimeters wide. And once the heat shrink is on, you can attach these bearings to their printed part. Now I added the M3 bearings into the pulley that sits in the bearing block at the top. Ideally, these should be able to just be pressed in, but for me, the tolerances weren't quite right and I had to use my vise to clamp them in. Once those bearings are in, you can put that pulley into the bearing block. Note that I put one M3 washer on either side of that pulley just to stop wear. Now we're getting into the tricky part. I cut these strings to be about 1.6 meters long and that gives plenty of extra so that I can chop it off at the end later on. Trust me when I say that you really don't want to be in the position of having just wound it up to realize that your strings are just too short to reach. It's very frustrating. Before feeding the string through the hole in the spool, tie a bunch of knots in the end of it so that way it can't get pulled through. I've been using a figure of eight on a bite with a thumb knot added to it just to give it an extra bit of size and I've never had that pull through. I suggest winding one side with one to two winds and then the other side with as many winds as you can fit and then hold these two winds down with a little bit of masking tape. Once you've got the string wound on, you can put the spool onto the motor and then slide that entire assembly into the larger printed part. Using four M3 by 20 bolts, you can affix the motor mount plate to the larger printed part. For me at least, because I wasn't able to insert the threaded inserts perfectly straight, some of these bolts don't go in the whole way, but they don't really need to, they're just there to stop the whole thing from sliding out. Again, here I had to give these carbon fiber tubes a light tap to get them into place, just because of the way that my printer added the elephant's foot. I like to add the bottom part of the actuator on now as well, so that way I can hold the whole thing a little bit more easily when I'm routing the string through. When you're attaching the top part of the actuator to the bottom part, pay close attention to the orientation of the two parts, because there's a string that goes through one of the carbon fiber tubes, and you need to make sure that those two pulleys are lined up. Again, it's a good idea to just test it that everything's running smoothly, and if everything's lined up correctly, then that central carbon fiber tube should perfectly cover the hole in the bottom. Now we can tighten up all those bolts to firmly attach the top part and the bottom part. I recommend slightly inserting the bolts to the top and the bottom caps of the central carbon fiber tube because these are a lot easier to do now than when they're in place. Just do these up a little bit so that way you still have enough room to wrap the string around. And here I am inserting that insert that I forgot about earlier. Now comes the all important wire. You would have a very, very hard time putting these actuators together without a wire like this. So I strongly recommend finding something that you can use to pull the string through that you can bend a little hook into. Starting off with a string that was only wound around the spoolie once or twice, so it has the most length free, start feeding it through the pulleys in the lower part of the actuator. Pay close attention to the layout of these. In the prototype actuator that I made, I actually routed these strings incorrectly and it still worked, but there was a lot more friction and wear than there needed to be. Just pay close attention to the diagram in the bill of materials to make sure you're getting it the right way around. For most of this routing, you can get by using the wire with the hook bent into the end, but for one of the sections, I found that it's easiest to just stuff the string in until it pokes out the other side. Just keep stuffing it in and in and in until eventually it comes out the other side. Having sharp tweezers here is also extremely helpful. I frequently used both the curved and the straight pointed tweezers. Once you've got that first length of string through, wrap it around its bolt and tighten it up a little bit just to hold it in place. Now you should be able to pull on the other length of string that was wrapped around heaps of times and you should be able to pull enough through that it can reach to the other bolt. 
And same thing as before, just pay close attention to the diagram in the bill of materials to make sure that you're routing the string the correct way around. Before tightening everything up for the final time, just do one final check to make sure that the string has actually gone around all of the pulleys. If there's any slack in the line, then it's fairly common for the string to come off of one of the pulleys, and that can be very easy to miss. Just remember that there are six pulleys, so always be checking all six of them every time you look at the path of the string. Now the last thing that I attach is this little foam piece that I cut a slit into and drill a hole into. And this goes onto the lower part of the actuator with the string going through that hole in the center. This piece is here so that we can do a homing sequence where the actuator essentially just rams into the end and detects the current spike. And using the current spike, we can know that it's hit the end of the actuator. We use this piece of foam here just to make that contact as soft as possible. And that's it. You should have a fully working linear actuator now. Note that this took me just over an hour to put together and I'd already put together all of the other five. So I was fairly experienced with it at this point. So if you're gonna build a full steward platform with these, definitely set aside the day just for building the actuators. Cool, well, I hope someone found this useful and I'll see you in the next one.